your first time to church, you might be in the video experience, in the living room, or watching online, and maybe feeling a little confused. Why is everyone yelling? Why is everyone singing? First, let me say, this is how we do church. This is how we do church, especially on a celebration Sunday like today. We are celebrating. Whether you believe in following Jesus, you believe in Christianity or not, what world history will say was that there is a man named Jesus who walked this earth. And what we believe as followers of Jesus is that he lived a sinless life, died a horrific death, but he is not in the grave. So I need you to fill this house with some truth. If you feel comfortable, you repeat after me and say, no body. Because there is no body in that grave. And because there is no body in the grave, nobody is kept away from the love of God. Because there is no body in the grave, we get to receive the gift of salvation. Because there is no body in the grave, you could be righteous or ratchet. You are welcome to sit at the table. Amen? So welcome to the Father's house. Jesus, we invoke your mighty name and we celebrate. Not only are you good, not only are you kind, not only are you gracious, but you are a mighty God full of power. And today we celebrate that you did as you said that you would do. Speak to us in this space. Change our hearts, change our minds. We come with our burdens and our, our thoughts, our feelings, our insecurities. We lay them down at your feet so that you can speak to us here. In the mighty name of Jesus, the church of God says, amen, amen. All right, do me a favor, do me a favor. You might be new here, do me a favor. I always hate when I went to church and the pastor would say, turn to your neighbor and say, but you want to know something? It's Resurrection Sunday. And the reason why we have gathered is because not only is Jesus resurrected from the grave, but he did this as an act of love for you. So do me a favor, turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus loves you. And put in the chat box, Jesus loves you. Because that's the truth. And after that, you can go ahead and grab a seat. Yes. Now I get it, fam. I get it. I get it might be a little overwhelming. You might be sitting here feeling like, I don't know if Jesus loves me. How could I trust that he does? The truth of the matter is in our culture, in our day and, age, uh, day and age, we say things all the time. Love you. <laughs> Love you. You're so great. Love you. You can be in some dysfunctional relationships and say, I love you, and you don't mean it. So how, telling on ourselves today, yes, sir. <laughs> So how do we know what love really is? It is when our words match our actions. What you say must match what you do. How do you know if somebody loves, me, loves you? You know if somebody loves you if they offer to take you to LAX during rush hour traffic, <laughs> all right? For our online global family, LAX is International uh, Airport here in Los Angeles. It's basically Dante's fifth ring of hell. No one wants to go there. So when someone takes you, that's love, baby. You know what love is? Love is when you have to move to a new house and people help you move. And they bring a truck. Glory to God. You know what I'm saying? You know what love is? When you have your favorite dessert that you're sharing with somebody and you save the very last bite for them. That's love. That's love but could also be much deeper than that. It could be loving somebody selflessly and sacrificially. It could be making a promise and keeping it. Today, yes, we turn up, we've got coffee bar, we've got donuts, we're, we're hanging out and it's family, it's a celebration. But today is more than just loud songs or wearing your Sunday best or even a good excuse to buy a white suit. <laughs> Show it for Jesus. Show it for Jesus. But, but, I digress. I digress. It's not, and, and the shoes, and the white heels. Glory to God. Thank you for noticing that detail. Mm. But you want to know something? We can joke about those things. But really, we have come to celebrate that Jesus gave his life for us. John 15, 12 says this, no greater love than for you to lay your life down for one's friends. Do you know that Jesus considers you his friend? Jesus considers you his friend. Now, we understand this concept. I want it to make it a little bit more practical. Uh, for those that serve in the military, first and foremost, thank you. Maybe you have a loved one that has served in the military. Yeah, absolutely. But when you sign up to serve in the military, you are essentially putting your life on the line 
for the safety, the freedom, and protection of all of us who don't. If you have been a recipient of an organ donor or you have been around somebody that has donated an organ, this is beautiful because they are taking something of them that gives them life and giving it to somebody else. God wants to demonstrate his great love for us that even when we were messed up and unworthy of his love, Jesus was sent to demonstrate God's love for us. If you're not familiar with church, this concept might feel a little overwhelming. So part of the thing that I'm most passionate about is I like to make things very simple. And if you had to express or explain the Easter story, the best way to communicate it is that sin brought Jesus to earth. Love sent him to the cross and his resurrection brings us victory. So please fill God's house with this truth. Somebody say nobody. nobody. The life of Jesus, when we talk about his life, must always include not just his good deeds, not only his miracles, not only the things that he said and the good man that he was, when telling the life and times of Jesus, we have got to include that there is no body in his grave, that the resurrected Savior isn't in his tomb. My goal in our time spent together is that we journey to take a look at what happened to the body of Jesus to prove to you that his death gives you life and his resurrection gives you power. Turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 14. We're going to start in verse 32. And as you turn there, we're actually diving into the life and times of Jesus right before he's about to get crucified. I'm going to pull out some scriptures in Mark 14, 15, and 16 because I want to take us on a journey. For us to understand that there's no body in the grave, his greatest act of love was giving of himself. And we get to discover in this passage that his actions backed up his words. That's love. Let's start in verse 32. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, can you guys sit here? Can you sit here while I go away to pray? And we're going to find out why he said this, but he took three of his friends. He took Peter, James, and John along with him. And scripture tells us right here, he began to be deeply distressed and troubled deeply distressed and troubled. And Jesus said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Why did, why did Jesus say such things? So sometimes we can read words and not understand like the implication of it. But when Jesus says distressed, there is deep, severe psychological meaning to this word distressed. So he's sorrowful, he's distressed, and then he says something that I don't want to be lost on us. He said, even to the point of death. Jesus is saying, I don't even want to live. I want that to sink in. Because if you're here today and you feel overwhelmed, sorrowful, distressed, or like you don't want to live, there's a man named Jesus who understands the psychological pain of mental health issues. We have a savior that knows that journey and a savior that loves you. He didn't just say the words. He backed it up with his actions. This is the story of Easter. If you're a note taker, I want to take out these three simple truths about, the East, about Easter so we can build a framework for understanding that his body was broken for you and for me. If you're a note taker, I want you to write down, our sin brought Jesus to earth. That's the first simple truth of Easter. It was Jesus' assignment. He was born to die. 1 John 2, 2 says that Jesus is a propitiation for our sins. Sometimes when we go to church, there's all these big words and we're like, oh, what are you saying? Uh, propitiation is a substitute. That Jesus became substitute for us. That our sin was put on him. But this wasn't an easy decision. Jesus is a good guy. Jesus is the son of God. Must have been easy. We see the frail humanity of this 33-year-old man who is tasked to bear the sin and the weight of the world. Look at verse 35. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, this hour might pass from him. What does this mean? Let's make it plain for the folks. Get me out of here. I don't want to do this. Look at what he says. This 33-year-old man, he says in verse 36, Abba, Father, 
That word in Hebrew is daddy. When you're so desperate, daddy, God, everything is possible for you. Everything is possible for you. You could change your mind. He said, take this cup from me. It wasn't a physical cup. Jesus wasn't holding a physical cup. It's a metaphor for like, you could take this away. I don't have to drink from this cup. And then he says this, yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus is saying, please, I don't want to do this. But if this is what you want, I will do it. So Luke, the book that we're reading right now, Luke was a disciple of Jesus. And the four, first four books of the New Testament are called the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all record this moment. Um, Mark is giving us a psychological viewpoint into Jesus' pain and suffering. But Luke, uh, in the Gospel of Luke, Luke is a physician. Luke is going to give us a medical diagnosis of what is going on during Jesus' turmoil, sorrow, and distress. You don't have to turn there, but in Luke twenty two forty four, Luke records that Jesus was praying with such fervency. Please take this cup from me. Please. That he was praying with such fervency that he began to sweat droplets of blood. That's not true. I've never seen it. Actually, it is a rare and diagnosed medical condition called hemotidrosis. That is when the capillary blood vessels uh, under extreme stress and duress, burst and seep through the pores. So you're essentially sweating blood. These situations usually only happen under extreme physical or emotional duress. What was that duress? Jesus was about to face and experience the most excruciating pain and bear the sin of the world. After this moment that Jesus is praying, He's taken by Roman garrisons, like a, a group of Roman soldiers, and taken over to Jews, religious people. These are Jesus' people. You're my brothers. You're my people. And there in this kangaroo court at around midnight, they start accusing him and making accusations. They begin to pummel him. They begin to beat him. They begin to pull his beard, which is an ultimate sign in Middle Eastern of disrespect, and spit on him, ultimate disrespect. With every sweltering punch, his body bore our sin. With every backhanded slap, his body bore our sin. With every accusation made against this man named Jesus, his body bore our sin. Go down to Mark 15 verse 12. We're going to skip a couple verses. So after this kangaroo court, then Jesus is taken from his people, the Jews, over to a man named Pilate. Uh, Pilate is a Roman official during this time, and Pilate had the power to determine who lives and who dies. Pilate's confused. Here's this man. He doesn't look kingly, and you've brought him to me. And this is where we pick this up in Mark 15, verse 12. Confused, Pilate's like, what do you want me to do then with the one that you call king of the Jews? And the people shouted, crucify him. What? Pilate's confused. What? Why? What crime has he committed? But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. There in the judgment seat next to Pilate, Jesus is presented to hordes of people. Jesus is exhausted from praying through the night and begging God to change, bleeding out drops of blood. God, take this cup from me. He's beaten, he's slapped, his body is, is pummeled, he's mocked, and his own people have now rejected him. Look at verse 15. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas. Who was Barabbas? Barabbas was a, a fool. Barabbas was a criminal, shady McShady. And yet he released Barabbas to them, and he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Again, these words like flogging, maybe your biblical translation says scourging. We don't understand these words because we don't practice this anymore. We don't practice this because this is inhumane. In fact, flogging was reserved for vile criminals. Flogging was so hurtful, so dangerous, that many people died from flogging alone. It's basically like a public whipping. But we have to understand is that a whip, as we understand, has a handle and one piece of leather. 
But during that time, uh, Romans would call and refer to this particular whip as a cat of nine tails. Why? Because there was roughly about nine pieces of leather attached to one handle. And at the end of every piece of leather attached to it was bone fragments, metal, glass, so that when the whip went across the victim's body, all of the leather pieces would attach to the body, and when pulled, would take skin, sinew, tendon, muscle, again and again and again. I want to paint a picture of the punishment that this poor man went through. One piece of leather with one piece of shrapnel will make one laceration. But there's nine pieces of leather, maybe even ten, each having metal or fragment. So with one whip, you're not getting one laceration, you're getting nine. During this time, they believed that 40 lashings, 40 whippings, were cruel and unusual punishment. So they decided that 39 was that of mercy. How kind of the Romans. Jesus was whipped 39 times with nine different lashes every single time, which would mean that Jesus' body was exposed to over 400 lacerations on his skin. This is why Isaiah prophetically stated in Isaiah 53 verse 4, yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrow that weighed him down. And we thought his trouble were punishment from God, a punishment for his own sin, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sin. He was beaten so we could be made whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. So when Isaiah says he was whipped so he could be healed, so that we could be healed, every time you envision the whip cracking the skin of Jesus and pulling flesh off his bone, I need you to know and hold to this reality. He did this for you. He did this for me. Jesus' sin, or excuse me, our sin, brought Jesus to earth. This is the truth of the gospel story. Our love, his love for us, sent him to the cross. Go to verse 16. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace that is the praetorium and called together the whole company of soldiers. These are not feeble men. Roman soldiers are huge. Envisioning your mind, NFL football players. They're big guys. They put a robe on him, a purple robe, signifying uh, royalty to mock Jesus. Then they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again, they struck him on the head with the staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him to mock him. Jesus was a bloody piece of flesh when he arrived at the praetorium. And Mark tells us that again and again, they beat him with a rod on his head. But we need to understand that the crown of thorns isn't like small thorns from a rose. In Israel... Thorns are roughly six to eight inches in length and have the density of human bones. So a crown is on Jesus' head and they beat him again and again and again. So the image that we've been falsely given of a light-skinned, feeble-looking man wearing a loincloth and a couple drops of blood hanging on a cross that we wear in our jewelry isn't the picture. It is a bruised, bloody, bludgeoned mess of a man. He's unrecognizable. Isaiah 52 prophetically states that he was unrecognizable to those who would know him. The scripture says that his visage was marred. His face was jacked up. His face was busted. Jesus went to the cross out of love for you and for me. Look at verse 20. And when they mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put on his own clothes. Then they led him out to crucify him. What is crucifixion? Crucifixion was invented by the Persians, 
but perfected by the Romans. Perfected how? Well, perfected because they discovered the longest way to possibly kill somebody. The way that you can inflict the longest amount of pain before somebody's life is taken. Arguably, this is the most painful death ever invented by man. We get our word excruciating from this word, crucifixion. So after Jesus had been stripped naked by the Roman guards and put back into whatever little clothes he was wearing, his back was exposed. He had been up for over 36 hours at this point. He's dehydrated. He's experiencing fatigue, extreme blood loss. And then they give him a crossbar, which will be what he's affixed to as he hangs on the cross. They put a splintered piece of wood on the back of a man whose back had been opened with over 400 lacerations. He's so weak. Scripture tells us at one point he falls to the floor on the way to Calvary where he's going to be crucified. And a man by the name of Simon the Cyrene picks up the crossbar because Jesus cannot. When he arrives to the mount at Calvary on Golgotha, a victim is then stretched over this crossbar and their hands are nailed, not through their hand because the weight of the body that allowed it to slip and not through the arm where it would get a, a vein and easily bleed out. No, it's too kind. To insert a nail right in between the wrist and the forearm so it would be a slow loss of blood and a torturous death. When we think about the broken, bloody, bludgeoned, bruised body of Jesus hanging on the verge of death, I want you to actually hear the banging of a hammer hitting the head of a nail. When you cuss out that coworker or your spouse or you speak negatively about them, it's that sound that put Jesus on the cross. When you cheat on your taxes, when you cheat on your exam, when you cheat on your wife, Jesus endured the cross for you. When you self-righteously gossip about them, when you cast judgment because of political affiliation, when you judge them because of the color of your skin, Jesus went to the cross for you. Let me let you know, nails didn't keep Jesus there. Love did. Love kept Jesus on the cross for you, for me, for Isaiah, for Gray, for Elizabeth, for Tony. Love kept Jesus on the cross. Look at verse 33. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabatini, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because of the hanging position of a victim, breathing becomes excru excruciating and incredibly hard. Why is that? Because your lungs are collapsing as your body is becoming unhinged. Your arms dislocate from your torso, your elbows dislocate, your wrists wrist dislocate, and pretty soon the weight of your body is internally crushing your lungs. You are asphyxiating. The only way to inhale and get breath is for you to push up on your legs over the pierced feet to <gasps> catch your breath. That is why everything that Jesus said on the cross is wildly important. Jesus felt abandoned by God. Have you felt abandoned by God? Jesus knows your pain. With his very last breath, he's trying to breathe. And the harder it is to breathe, the more the heart has to pound, the more your heart has to work. With his heart pounding in his chest, the very last word that Jesus utters on the cross is this, to tell us die, it is finished. And with that, he breathed his last breath. When Jesus said those words, he's essentially saying, it is done. The assignment has been fulfilled. And with that, he let out a deep, loud cry. 
Can you hear it? Can you see it? It is not a cry of defeat. It's a cry of victory. Ah! It's done. Medically speaking, it is during this time that Jesus' lungs collapsed and his heart began to fail. After severe dehydration and an inadequate ability to breathe, a victim will suffocate. And in many severe cases of cardiac arrest, such as crucifixion, it is medically true that a heart can rupture. It's called a cardiac rupture. It is medically probable to say that Jesus died of a broken heart. Jesus was beaten for you. Jesus was mocked for you. Jesus was spat on for you. Jesus was flogged for you. Jesus was pierced for you. Jesus was nailed to a cross for you. And Jesus' heart broke for you. Sin brought Jesus to earth. Love sent him to the cross. See, we know why he came and we know why he died. But why did he rise? Why did Jesus rise? Why is today that day that we celebrate the Easter story is still noble and still beautiful and still true without the empty tomb. He loved us so much that he died for us. Amazing. But why isn't that the end of the story? Because it doesn't end there. Jesus' death brought us life. Jesus' last breath has given us an opportunity to breathe in his truth, his goodness, his freedom, and his life. His resurrection has given us victory. That is why we celebrate. We can't talk about the extreme love of God unless we know what his body went through to pay the cost for that deep love. It's not just saying, I love you. Jesus said, I love you so much. I stretched my arms out and said, this is how much I love you. This is how much I love you. Look at Mark 16 too. Very early on the first day of the week, which would have been their Sunday, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. Side note, this is a later service, bless your heart. But we had a 6.30 a.m. sunrise service out in the living room. The sun came up, but the windows were open. We were worshiping Jesus, a little praise party. And I think that they're the extra holy people, and they're going to get an extra blessing today. I'm glad you are caffeinated. Glad you're caffeinated. But next year, you get another shot. 6.30, don't miss out, right? You can be like the women. Side note, women showed up first. That's right. Okay. Verse 3. The women asked each other. They were there to anoint the body of Jesus. They thought he was dead in the grave. We love Jesus, but he's dead. This is so sad. They roll up and they're like, yo, girl, how are you going to move that stone that's blocking the tomb? Who will roll the stone away at the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Oh, my gosh. And the angel says, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified, was. If you brought your own Bible, circle the word was. I'm a writer by trade. We're talking about past tense. He was crucified. He has risen. How do you change tenses unless something supernatural happens? He was crucified. He is alive. That body that was there is no longer there. He is not there. So somebody, please fill this house with some faith and say no body. Death wasn't the end. The defeat of death is the hope of salvation. Jesus said, I will conquer death. That's why Paul says, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? This means that we anticipate our resurrection because of Jesus' resurrection. Paul the apostle takes it one step further, and he wrecks our theology. He wrecks our mind. He says, oh, check this out. The same power, Romans 10, 8, the same power that resurrected Jesus from the grave lives in you. He doesn't love you so much just to die for you. He loves you so much that he's going to empower you with strength to do the things that you cannot do in your own strength. Sin brought Jesus to earth. Love sent him to the cross. Resurrection gave us victory. And let me tell you why Christianity and following Jesus is unlike any other world religion that I respect. I respect everyone's status of faith. But let me just tell you why following Jesus is different. It's different because in every other organized world religion, they will tell you, do this 
to receive that. In Buddhism, do this. In Islam, do this. In Hinduism, do this. And you might receive. In Christianity, in following Jesus, it has nothing to do with what we've done and everything to do with what Jesus has done. He's already done it. See, religion says do. Jesus says it's already done. To tell us die. To tell us die. It is finished. Resurrection is victory over death. And victory over death means that we can have eternal life. That's why John 3.16 so clearly states that whosoever shall believe in Jesus shall not die, but have everlasting life. And that is the ultimate point of Easter. Jesus took your pain and your shame on the cross because he loved us. Jesus took our sin and failure to the cross because he loved us. Jesus took our depression and our desires to the cross because he loved us. His pain brought us purpose. His bruising brought us healing. He was pierced to ease our pain. He died to bring life. He was risen and brings power. He reigns to bring us peace. Jesus didn't just say he loved you. He gave up his life for you. Jesus proved that he had power over the grave because grave couldn't keep him down there's nobody in that grave and because there's no body in that grave nobody is kept from the love of God if you get anything out of our time together and the crux and the reason of why we celebrate is because Jesus loves you Jesus loves you Jesus loves you you Jesus loves you just as you are but he loves you too much to let you stay there Jesus loves you all of you and everything about you every hurt stored up every hope every dread every hair on top of your head he loves you he loves you he loves you so much he gave his life for you and if you're here today and you've never said yes to Jesus Maybe it, may, it never made sense. Maybe you didn't believe it. Maybe you couldn't receive it. If you're here today in the video experience, in the living room, watching online, watching live or watching later during the week, you are loved by God and he wants to be in a relationship with you. You're not saying yes to religion. You are saying, I give my life to Christ. He's given me life and freedom, a debt I could not pay. His dying breath has brought me life. I give him my life and surrender to him. If you're here today and you've never said yes to Jesus, or maybe at one point you were walking with the Lord, but you've turned away, and you know what well, your grandma took you to church, or your mom made you read the Bible, but now you're at a point where you're like, no, this is my faith. That's my God. This is my forgiveness. If that is you, you've never said yes to Jesus, or you're coming back to faith, we want to invite you, not force you, invite you to make a decision that will have a profound impact on your future and it's following Jesus I'm not here to say that your life is gonna be perfect I'm here to say that we serve a perfect God who will transform you into the person that he's calling you to be if you've never said yes to Jesus or you want to come back to faith I'm gonna to count to three and you're boldly gonna raise up your hand online video experience living room in this room but before I do I need us to understand by raising your hand you are saying one I want Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior Two, by raising your hand you are saying my mistakes and my failures could be forgiven because of what Jesus did on the cross at Calvary. And three, the same spirit that resurrected Jesus from the grave will live in me. So if that is you, do me a favor. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes to create a sacred space. It ain't nobody's business. It's between you and the Lord. If you're in the video experience in the living room, there's people there that could see your hands. But if that is you, you're saying yes to Jesus. One, two, three. Will you boldly raise your hand? God bless you. 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 God bless you in the video experience in the living room. If you're online, put in the chat box. We have people that are praying for you. It's an amazing decision. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Yes. God bless you. God bless you, sir. May generations be impacted because of your legacy in this decision. God wants to use you in this ripe season of your age. The wisdom that you have within you, sir, that God's gonna use you to impact generations after you. This is the best years that you will see in your life. 
I don't know if you have children, but what I will say is that your children and children's children will be impacted because of this critical decision to return your heart to the Lord. Hey, if you're here and you are the people that raised your hand, we just want to pray a prayer of faith. It's not a magic prayer, but sometimes we need language to help us frame what is it that we believe. And so if you're one of the people that raised your hand, will you do me a favor? We repeat after me, it's this invitation. And also if you're a believer in Jesus, let, let our brothers and sisters know they're not alone in this decision and join in with them. Will you repeat after me and say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today I choose you as my Lord and Savior. Cleanse my heart, cleanse my mind, cleanse my conscience. Fill me with your spirit to do what I cannot do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.